first matter on this afternoon's calendar is number 59, Viking Pump versus TIG Insurance. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Um, I will, my name's Robin Cohen, and I represent Warren Pumps, and I will be handling the allocation portion of the argument, and Mr. Fortas will be handling horizontal exhaustion. May I begin, Your Honors? Yes, rebuttal time, please. Yes, five minutes um, total, and we'd ask that we be able to decide after the presentation. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. Your Honors, this insurance dispute is unique because both the drafters of the non-cumulation provisions, Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, and the parties to the insurance contract for which these excess carriers follow form are in fundamental agreement on how the non-cumulation provisions impact the allocation. It is undisputed that Liberty Mutual Insurance Company drafted the standard form non-cumulation provisions in 1966. And it is also undisputed that in this case, Liberty Mutual paid Viking and Warren in excess of $180 million on an all sums basis. It's also undisputed that during that period of time, the excess carriers. So, Council, let, let me just ask are you asking us to look at the contract and its provisions and, and then say that's what the contract says, or are you asking us to do something else? Your Honor, we're asking you to look at the contract. We believe and we submit that the contract is clear and unambiguous. But in the alternative, to the extent that the court finds that the provision is, uh, is ambiguous, Liberty Mutual's conduct is certainly relevant to the reasonableness of the positions that Viking and Warren took. The drafter of the provision understood and paid $180 million based upon an all sums basis. And that payment over a 22 year period on an all sums basis is consistent with the position that the excess carriers took before the trial court. Their own expert testified at trial that the non-cumulation provision was inconsistent with the pro rata allocation, and if is that is that the essentially what your um, what your argument is, rather than, or are you saying that the non cumulation provision in itself suggests one method of allocation over another? Yes, we think it's one method, Your Honor, and we believe our interpretation is the only reasonable interpretation. But at least, at least it's a reasonable interpretation, and the best evidence of that is not only the liberties course of conduct over the last 22 years, but the excess carrier's position before the trial court. Not only did their expert testify that the non-cumulation provisions were inconsistent with a pro rata allocation, the excess carriers for seven years before the trial court took the position that you cannot apply the non-cumulation provision in a pro rata allocation. And so whether you look at the Liberty's course of conduct or you look at the admissions by the excess carriers, they all point to the fact that, Liberty's that, that Warren's position is reasonable. What did the court do in Olin? Olin, Your Honor, Olin 3 dealt with not the Liberty provision, but dealt with the prior insurance um, provision. And in that case, the policyholder was arguing that you can aggregate and collapse 22 years of post-policy period damage into one year and go up vertically and hit a, an excess policy that was on top of $30 million. So what they were arguing, in essence, was an all-summed allocation, that you could collapse and you could aggregate it all in one year. Now, the carriers in that case were arguing the opposite, that you have to prorate. In fact, they had some ammunition. The prior two Olin decisions had said that, that you, could, you have to prorate. But the court said in Olin 3, it's different. And it's different because of the non-cumulation provision. 
the court said in this particular situation, in light of the non-cumulation provision, the parties had agreed to not only have the policies pay within the policy period, but to pay outside the policy period. So what they allowed the policyholder to do is to aggregate it all and hit that excess policy. That, in essence, is an all summed allocation. That is what we are seeking here with respect to the post-policy damage. Now, what they rely okay, on... Let's stay on Olin 3 for a second. Um, uh, is it your position that the Second Circuit correctly interpreted this Court's holding in, in Con Ed? Well, Your Honor, in Con Ed, the Court did not have the non-cumulation provision. So we didn't have to harmonize the during the policy period and the non-cumulation provision. In fact, in Con Ed... Well, there they said in the absence of contractual language, but in point of fact, there was contractual language in Con Ed that was being interpreted. So they might have gotten that part of it wrong. Well, Your Honor, this Court in Con Ed said in the absence of a non-cumulation provision you prorate for an indemnity. But in, in Olin 3, there was a non-cumulation provision. And so in that case, in light of the non-cumulation provision, Olin 3 aggregated and did an all sums allocation for the post-policy period damage. What the See, the way I read Con Ed is that they said pro rata was consistent with the policy language. Yes, in the absence of a non-cumulation provision. In fact, in Con Ed, this Court expressly distinguished its policies from the policies in the Hercules case, which had a non-cumulation provision. So it recognized that there was a possibility that, in fact, it wouldn't be pro rata, for indemnity if the language was different. So we could give it the interpretation you want and still be consistent with Olin 3 is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. So, so it, uh, sorry, is your, is your position that there's no conflicting language in the policies or that there's mandatory language in the policies? We or be- both? <laughs> sure, sure. We believe, Your Honor, that in, that, that in order to harmonize during the policy period in the coverage grant, with the non-cumulation provision, there's only one reasonable interpretation. And that interpretation is an all sums allocation. And the reason is, if you go to the liberty provision, and I'm basing it on undisputed facts, everyone agrees that the liberty non-cumulation provision is designed to cover a situation where you have multiple policies covering the same injury. That cannot happen in a pro rata allocation. And the reason is, in a pro rata allocation, if you have a multi-year injury, what you do is you take that indivisible injury, you cut it up into pieces, and each policy only pays for the distinct injury during the policy period. So once you prorate, you never have multiple policies paying for the same injury. And, and how do you know what injury applies to what year? Each policy ha- pays not only for injury inside the policy period, but outside the policy period. And that's why you have multiple policies paying for the same injury, and then you apply the non-cumulation provision, which provides a cap. The problem with I see my time is up, but the, 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 the most important point is that the Liberty Non-Cumulation Clause is meaningless if they are right that during the policy period means that you only pay for injury during the policy period because you would never have multiple policies paying for the same well, but, injury. But, but it's a legal fiction, really, in law – because of long tail claims, because you got asbestos claims, you have a unique, a unique kind of claim that has to be spread out. So it's not, in fact, uh, multiple occurrences, but it's a legal fiction that's engaged in for pro rata um, payouts. But whether it's a legal fiction or not, Your Honor, mm-hmm. the underlying premise for a pro rata allocation is each policy 
only pays for injury during its policy period. So you never have multiple policies. Oh, I agree with you on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And right. that's why you could never trigger this provision, the, the liberty non-cumulation provision, once you pray, prorate, because the prerequisite isn't there. I see. Okay. And that is why that the new methodology that they have, they have espoused, where you allocate both, which is inconsistent with their position below, doesn't make any sense because once you prorate, you cannot um, trigger the liberty non-cum clause. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Michael Fortas, and I'm handling the issue of vertical versus horizontal exhaustion. The insurers in this case claim that Viking Pump is obligated to exhaust all of its underlying primary and umbrella policies in every year, both before and after a particular excess year, before it can access any excess insurance in any year. And that principle, which has been called horizontal exhaustion, they urged was a matter of settled New York law in the Delaware courts. And based on that premise, they have paid Viking Pump nothing under their policies, even while paying Warren Pump claims a uh, situation that the Delaware court jury found was in breach of the obligation of fair dealing under the contracts. The excess insurers now have conceded that there is no overriding principle of New York law at stake here. The only principle of New York law that matters is the one that enforces the plain meaning of the contract, the parties deal as expressed in their contractual language. And that contractual language we submit compels the conclusion that these policies may be exhausted on a vertical basis. Now that they are before this court, the insurer has minted three brand new arguments that were never raised in the Delaware courts, including in the Delaware Supreme Court. One based on the insuring agreements of their policies, one based on the other insurance provisions of their policies, and one based on the liberty mutual retain limit. None of those arguments establish a plain meaning that favors horizontal exhaustion. Let me take each one briefly in turn. The excess insurers have agreed and have stated in their responsive brief in this court that if losses are allocated on a pro rata basis, if this court were to adopt a pro rata scheme, that the policyholders here may seek coverage from a triggered excess policy once the directly underlying policy in the same policy years have been exhausted. Now, they're loath to call that uh, vertical exhaustion, but that's precisely what it is. And there is no reason for this court to construe those policies to permit vertical exhaustion in one allocation context and require horizontal allocation in another context. The Superior Court in Delaware agreed that there was policy language supporting the vertical exhaustion conclusion. In fact, it was the only policy language that anybody pointed to on this issue. The excess carriers did not make a policy-based argument in the Delaware courts. Now, for the first time, they try to sidestep that language, and that language is found in the underlying insurance provisions of their excess policies. They argue uh, one thing in principle with respect to those provisions. They point to the language of some of those underlying insurance provisions, and they say, well, they set up a necessary but not sufficient condition to exhaust uh, vertically. That, lang that argument is inconsistent with the underlying insurance So just, just to be clear, you, are we talking about the 79 excess policies? Are, are they the, the, it's the actually, following form from those policies? Is that, tell me. It's actually all the excess, every one of the excess policies that are at issue in this case. I think the parties use the 79 as an exemplar, Your Honor. Uh -huh. But all of them have some underlying insurance provision. And the excess concede that the underlying insurance provision in every one of those policies in every year only references the underlying insurance in that particular policy. What about the other insurance provision? That, that seems to be a bit more problematic. The other insurance provision, there, there are really two main points to be made on the other insurance provision. First, uh, this court in Consolidated Edison, I think, properly uh, observed that those provisions are designed for the situation where you have concurrent insurance in the same year but not consecutive insurance spanning multiple uh, years. And in fact, the Fairbanks. How do we know that? 
Pardon me? How do we know that from the language of the policy? I, I, I think in fairness, it's hard to say for sure from the language of the policies. And that means I think it could be construed in either of two ways. And under those circumstances, two, two principles come into play. One, you should construe it such that all provisions have meaning and don't read out the underlying insurance provision. And two, uh, to the extent there's any ambiguity or doubt about the construction, it, be, it should be construed in favor of the policyholders in this case. Well, the, I thought the Delaware court, did too, they relied on Con Ed to say that uh, in a, in a cons it wouldn't apply to consecutive, only a concurrent situation. They, That's they, the way I read it. They did that. They did that actually in, I think, a, port of the, uh, a subsequent opinion where they were looking at all the excess policies. Uh -huh. And there the court says you can exhaust vertically. But for some reason, the court believed that when you were down at the umbrella layer, you know, at this very first layer, you can't. And I think those two parts of the opinion are, frankly, inconsistent uh, with one another. The other observation I'll make about, uh, Wait, about the other insurance. You, counsel, before you leave that observation, yes. um, are, 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 you, are both sides in agreement now that it can be vertical or horizontal? Because I think below, uh, the excess carriers argued that it would, could only be horizontal. The excess carriers argued only horizontal below. But, but they, they're not arguing that now. Now they appear to argue that if it's in a pro rata allocation scheme, it can be a vertical exhaustion, but not if there's an all sums scheme. Uh, so I, I think they're taking somewhat different positions. I was going to uh, simply observe that the other thing to say about the other insurance provisions is, is that other courts have uh, picked up on Consolidated Edison's uh, distinction uh, both, including courts in New York, and said that really is a provision designed for the concurrent coverage situation, including the Fairbanks opinion that the excess recently cited to in this, uh, by this court. And I'll note, we took a look at the excess briefs in the Fairbanks decision in the Fairbanks case, and the excess briefs in that case actually make precisely the argument we're making here, that, uh, that the other insurance provisions only apply in the concurrent uh, coverage uh, circumstance. Thank you, uh, Council. Th thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. Kathleen Sullivan for the excess insurers. I'd like to bring us back to what's actually before the Court, which is a narrow certified question of law. And the certified question of law on the allocation question is simply, uh, under New York law, is the proper method of allocation to be used, all sums or pro rata, when there are non-cumulation and prior insurance provisions? And the you answer- never answered that before? You have not answered it before. You should answer so that. Con Ed didn't answer that. That's correct, okay. Your Honor. You should answer it now, pro rata. Absolutely. And the way you should get there is you should go back to the method of Con Ed. Judge, Chief Judge Kaye's unanimous opinion for this court in 2002 set forth pro rata allocation as the proper interpretation of a policy that has an insuring agreement that measures injury or occurrence during the policy period. Now, did Judge Con Fahey. Ms. Ms. Sullivan, did Con Ed involve a non-cumulation clause or a other insurance provision clause? Your Honor, it did not discuss those provisions, but as we point out in Respondent's Brief at uh, page 13, note 5, the Con Ed policies had non-cumulation clause. They had non-cumulation clauses, so the parties to the Con Ed policies bargained for during the policy but period. nobody argued. That's that correct, Your Honor. Argued here, right? That's correct. So, so, we, that, so was that issue? It was not raised, briefed, raised. or decided, Your Honor. The only reason I point it out is it shows that the parties to the agreement thought that pro rata, which is derived from the language during the policy period, is compatible with and consistent with, from the party's standpoint, the non-cumulation clauses. So, Your Honor, the narrow question before you on allocation is, now that we are looking at the non-cumulation clauses, which this Court did not decide in Con Ed, can they be harmonized with the during the policy period clause, which is where the pro rata allocation came from? And the answer is the contracts unambiguously can be harmonized. The, the language of during the policy period can unambiguously be harmonized with the language of non-cumulation. Now, in, Judge Stein, in answer to your question, what happened in Olin III is the Second Circuit, uh, the three judges of the Second Circuit in Olin III did exactly that. They followed Con Ed and they harmonized. I, I find it hard to, to look at that decision and say that they did a clear pro rata allocation. They did, Your Honor. They absolutely did. Let, let me, if I could, could I just say that I'd like to simplify the contract interpretation issue by pointing out that there are three clauses at issue. 
The first clause is during the policy period. That's exactly the clause in Con Ed that led you to decide unanimously that pro rata allocation applies. But if you have provisions that talk about covering something beyond the termination of the policy or before, or how, how, can, how can that be just during the policy period? Your Honor, let's go to that language. And that language appears in uh, 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 all, all of the policies in one form or another. If I could just ask you when you look at all of this to look back at the three key pieces of language during the policy period is in all of the policies here. A good place to find it is on uh, pages A, uh, 517 and A519. That shows you that we're in Con Ed world because every one of the policies here has during the policy language. Now, Judge Stein, you say, well, let's look to the partly before, partly after language, the non cumulation provision. And when you look at that, 23 of the policies have it on page A518. 11 of the policies have it in materially identical form. A great example is on page 1176. That set does not, Your Honor, say that coverage applies before and during the policy period. It simply says that when there's a single occurrence policy limit, I've paid you my premium, I may have $10 million of damage, but I only get a per occurrence limit of up to $5 million, that per occurrence limit will apply if there has been a payment in a prior policy period. Now, Your Honor, you, let's go back to Olin 3. For, uh, uh, let's do this in three steps. Olin 3 says step one, pro rata allocation. And, Your Honor, what they did there is they took 31 years. It doesn't what Conrad said. It's the injury and the occurrence in the policy period, and that's what's missing here. It's not, Your Honor. It's injury not, it's not, that's not what Conrad says, or that's not what's missing here? I'm sorry, nothing is missing here. Okay. Everything that was in Conrad is still here. Injury during the policy period. So it's step occurrence one. Occurrence during the policy period? Occurrence and, and in, it's, this is injury during the policy period. Con Ed was occurrence during the policy theory, period. As the Fairbanks Court that we submitted the letter on says, there's no difference between injury during the policy period or occurrence during the policy period. Under Appalachia and against GE, we're a state in which one occurrence, single occurrence, is identified by a single claimant's exposure. Well, then why have that language if you're saying injury and occurrence mean the same thing? Your Honor, for, purpose, for our present purposes, mm -hmm. One occurrence, one injury. Let, let me try to go back. Here it is undisputed we have a single occurrence per claimant. Long tail exposure to asbestos, single occurrence, multiple policies. This is not like diocese. It's not a multiple occurrence case. It's a single I occurrence case. That. Single occurrence case, multiple policies. Uh, continued exposure over time. That's right, Your Honor. So the question here is the non-cumulation provision. Which, which is defined as a single occurrence. That's right, Your Honor. There's no dispute here, same occurrence. And if you look at page A15, uh, sorry, A518, the language of the non-cumulation policy, Your Honor, is non-cumulation of liability, same occurrence. And ju as Judge Fahey pointed out, pro rata is a kind of legal fiction. We have the same occurrence over multiple policy periods. And the key language we're looking at now that you didn't look at at Con Ed is the language that says where the injury occurs partly before and partly within the period. And, Your Honor, it doesn't say coverage attaches outside the policy period. We know from pro rata the coverage is in the policy period, during the policy period. It says the single occurrence limit, the per occurrence limit, applies in well, reduced uh, shares. If, if an injury is an occurrence, how do you get an injury in one part, one policy and an injury in another policy? It looks right. to me like you're conflating injury with an occurrence that's about multiple exposures. No, Your Honor. We got, we got long-term exposure. We got one injury, one occurrence. What we got is multiple policy periods because of pro rata. So what I'm asking you to do is see that. You're saying that the coverage is, has, to, it has to be coverage within the policy period, not yes. outside of the policy period. Your Honor, let's, let, let's walk through a simple example, and let's do what Olin 3 did, but let's simplify it. Let's say we have uh, $10 million in losses. We've got an exposed worker. 10 years of losses, the company that's paying is, uh, and let's say we have annual policy periods to make it easy. Proration is step one. At step one, we know from Con Ed, what we do is we divide the 10-year period into 10 annual policy periods, and there would be $1 million of loss. We divide the loss, that's what proration does at step one, we divide the loss over 10 periods. Now, why did we do that? We did that because, as Chief Judge Kay wrote for this court, that's how you interpret the language during the policy period that's here. And, Your Honor, that language is identical here. It's undisputed. 
at step one, we've now divided the loss. Now comes in the non-cumulation provision, and it says, oh, well, hello, you, you only bargained, you only paid a premium for $5 million per occurrence. It's the same occurrence. So now we've got $10 million of loss, $1 million a year. How does the non-cumulation provision work? It says, okay, let me pay you for year one. I pay you $1 million in year one. That means in year two, there's, we reduce the limits. That's what the non-cumulation clause says. Now there's $4 million left. In year two, we pay you a $1 million. Now there's $3 million left on, out of the single occurrence limit. In year three, we now pay you another $1 million. Now there's $2 million left. In year four, we pay you another $1 million. Now there's $1 million left. And by year five, the, horiz the, the per occurrence limit has been reached. Are you talking about the highest per occurrence limit on any of the policies? That's right, Your Honor. In my simple example, it's all the same. But it, it, what, what the non-cumulation provision does is say, for a, a premium that has paid for one per occurrence limit for the same occurrence, and it's undisputed here we have one occurrence. It's not a multiple occurrence case. It's one occurrence. If you've paid for one per occurrence limit, the non-accumulation clause says the insured can't stack the per occurrence limit for multiple policies and get more than the $5 million. Now, Your Honor, that's exactly what happened in Olin 3. Olin 3 gets to the end of its analysis and it says first prorate, 31 years, a uh, hundred plus million dollars of loss, 3.3 million dollars of loss a year. Then it looked to two particular policies that were triggered in the case, and it said, oh, but those policies had a one million dollar per occurrence limit. So even though Olin 3 said, well, there might have been 62 or 70, 67 or 72 million dollars of loss in each of these periods, the, the non-cumulation clause comes in harmoniously with pro rata allocation, and it limits the amount that can be paid. And the key language in, in Olin 3 says, we are harmonizing non-cumulation with proration. We are harmonizing them. And it, it, if you want to look at 794 F3rd at pages 104 to 105, that's where non-cumulation is harmonized with pro rata. And the Second Circuit says in so many words, we are harmonizing non-cumulation with pro rata. And the, and the insured there, Olin, uh, received the policy limit of only one policy or one million dollars. So, Your Honor, allocation and non-cumulation are doing two entirely different things, and that's why they can be harmonized. Per rata. Right you, you don't. You, you don't have that much time, and there are three major points that it, it, both you and the counsel at Cecilia, I'd like you to address if you can. The first is the inconsistency between your position in front of the Delaware courts and your position here. Um, the second point is the problem of double crediting. Which, which everyone, it's kind of the underlying policy argument that, that we're dealing with ourselves, and if you could address that. And of course, and the third point is, is that we would be, it, there's no court in the country that I think that has adopted your interpretation um, uh, of these policy provisions in conjunction uh, with uh, uh, a pro, pro rata allocation. Uh, and uh, so those are the three points that stick in my mind. Those are the kind of things that are in the back of my head. That, and, and you don't have too much time. I'd like you to really address those. If we spend too much time on Olin, we're never going to get to what's really behind this. Your Honor, let me start with the last one first. Every single court to interpret New York law looking at uh, pro rata plus a non-cumulation provision has interpreted our way except for, for Viking. Every single court that's interpreted a non-cumulation in New York law. I'm glad I asked this question because then now they can come up and disagree well, with Your it. Honor, so it's good. I, I, I'll, I'll cover both. Here. Your Honor, Olin 3, I promise you, look at Olin 3. It harmonizes non-cumulation with pro rata under Con Edison. So that's exhibit one. Second one is Fairbanks. We sent you Judge Codal's decision for the Southern District of New York. It harmonizes pro rata with non-cumulation exactly the way we do. Say that they do different things and they can be harmonized. Third exhibit is Mount McKinley, Judge Branston's decision in Supreme Court. Uh, in which she said that, well, Viking, the, the, just, uh, that the Delaware Chancery Court was being derisive toward Con Ed. It wasn't reading Con Ed. I'm reading Con Ed. I'm reading Con Ed with a non-cum clause, and I come out the same way we do. And Liberty Mutual versus JNS Supply, Judge Broderick's decision on the Southern District. So three judges of the Second, uh, Second Circuit, two judges of the Southern District, and one judge of Supreme Court have all said exactly what we've said, referring to exactly the same policy clauses under exactly the same Con Ed law, law of New York. Now, my friend will hop up and no doubt point to other states that are all some states or that are pro rata states that arrived at pro rata. Also, not some of those decisions 
we're operating under the assumption that we are a pro rata state period, right? Isn't that correct? Well, Your Honor, some other states are pro rata states, period. No, no, I know. I'm just, no. just the cases you're referring to. Yes, Your Honor. But the, the key question for you is New York law. And we strenuously urge you that Con Ed has been the settled law of New York since 2002. Pro rata has been the Yeah, I agree with you. The question is, is it settled that we look into the policy language, or, or is yes. it settled that it's pro rata? I guess that's the question. Your Honor, it's us. two things. It's settled that you look to the policy language. And we agree that if the policy language required a different outcome here, you could deviate. But the policy language does not require a different outcome here, because these are identical to the Con Ed policies plus non-CUM. Non-CUM can be harmonized, because non-CUM is doing a different function. Let me turn to double credit, Your Honor. There's no double credit. Because pro rata doesn't give a credit. Pro rata doesn't give any credit. Back in my $10 million over 10 years example, the, the insurer isn't getting a credit by proration. He still has to pay up to his policy limit for every policy period there was a, a policy issued. He's not getting any credit from proration. He still owes $10 million unless you hit a limit. The limit is $5 million. He's getting a credit from the non-CUM limit, Your Honor, but that's a, a single credit, question. not a double credit. Let me ask you a related question, and that is the relationship between horizontal exhaustion and a non-cumulation clause. Would it ever be possible for an insurer to, to, to cover, to exhaust the primary insurance if they can't stack them in order to get to the excess? Uh, Your Honor, the answer to the exhaustion question depends first on your answer to the allocation question. We say this contract requires pro rata. Right. If pro rata, you never get to the exhaustion question. Why is that? Because pro rata spreads the losses across all policies. So it's a de facto so, let's horizontal say we exhaustion. Think it, it should be all sums. Let's, your Honor, if you you don't, it, you don't agree, but if we did, then if you get there, Your Honor, then uh, we win because of the other insurance clauses that you pointed out. If you go with all sums, the proper interpretation of the exhaustion question and the answer to the second question is horizontal okay, exhaustion. I, I know. My question is, would it ever be possible under a horizontal exhaustion and a non-cumulation clause to exhaust the primary insurance and reach the excess? Absolutely, Your Honor, depending on the terms of the contract, which are not before you. All these hypotheticals and the hypotheticals my friends posed can be answered according to the terms of the different well, based policies. On the, based on the policies here. Would it ever be possible for Absolutely, that? Your Honor, depending on the terms of the policies. That is, let's say that you're, we're in, we think that you should adopt pro rata allocation. That's spread, I'm sorry, am I missing the question, Your well, Honor? I, I, what terms are you talking about? Uh, we're, we're dealing here with certain policies, and I'm asking you, under these policies, whether, whether this would be possible, and, and you say, well, it depends on the terms. What are the terms that it depends on? Your Honor, I, I need to respectfully ask if you could just repeat the, the exact question you'd like me to answer. The question is, is whether it's possible, assuming an all sums allocation, and, and to have horizontal exhaustion um, with, uh, with a non-cumulation clause and ever reach the excess policy. Yes, absolutely, under, depending on the policy. It's absolutely. Depending Your on Honor, what in the policy? Uh, depending on the uh, amount of the, non of the um, per occurrence limit. So it depends on the amount of the per occurrence limit in the policies. It depends on the amount of the aggregate limits in the policies. And from our perspective, it depends on the terms of the excess insurance policies. And, and we, it is absolutely possible pursuant to its terms. That's why the Delaware Chancery Court was quite wrong that on our theory there can never be uh, payment by the excess insurers. That's simply not true. It, it's possible. What's before this court is a simple question of law. And we respectfully suggest that these issues about whether exhaustion has occurred are before the Delaware Supreme Court. They turn on facts from the Delaware Supreme Court's record, and they're not before this court. What we would ask you to do is just do a simple act of contract interpretation, just the way the court did in Con Ed, and simply line up the language next to each other. And what I, the first thing I've tried to convince you of is that uh, non-cum, non-cumulation anti-stacking can be harmonized with proration. Olin three does it, and all the judges I've mentioned agree. All of the precedents on New York law, except for the Delaware Chancery Court, see it our way. There's another clause, and my friend referred to it, and it's also in Olin three. There's another clause about continuing coverage. That also can be harmonized with the policy here. So non-cumulation says if you paid some of your limit in a prior period, you get a credit in the next period for what you've already paid. I, 
Ms. Sullivan, you're saying we should stack up the language and we would answer the question essentially the way I, I presume you're saying we answered it in Con Edison or what people think we said in Con Edison, which is this is a pro rata state, right? No, Your Honor. No. Your Honor, I, I, I think everyone here agrees that Con Ed decided on pro rata as a matter of contract interpretation rather than as public policy. What we're saying to you is that's the settled law of New York and that contract interpretation here leads to an answer of pro rata in answer to the allocation question because non-cumulation and continuing coverage are harmonized, can be harmonized with pro rata. I, I'm just a and, bit confused then. If, if that's the way you're reading Con Edison, I'm a little confused why we have this certified question. I understand, Your Honor. Court. I, I understand, Your Honor. You said look at the language of the contract. And I, I understand, Your Honor. Well, with respect, we think the Delaware Chancery Court misinterpreted the contract under New York law. He paid lip service to New York law, but he didn't apply it. I noticed that all the New York judges and one Connecticut judge did interpret New York correctly. In doesn't this. your interpretation devolve to a pro rata state? Well, Your Honor, it and means. When would it not be pro rata? Well, you're Your Honor, saying with a non cumulation clause, it's still, you harmonize it as pro rata. Well, Your Honor, there could be other contracts that. Other than, of course, express language that says this is not pro rata, I guess. So, so, Your Honor, if the contract doesn't have during the policy period, Con Ed doesn't require that this be a pro rata state. It might be a good idea for you to announce that we're a pro rata state. Pro rata ha is very good. It incentivizes ins companies to get insurance from solvent insurers for every year. That's good for payouts to the people who depend on having their injuries reimbursed. And it would unsettle insurance, settled insurance law for you to say pro rata goes away the minute there's these two other clauses that can be perfectly harmonized with pro rata. So you shouldn't unsettle that. Question now, but, so, so, uh, but your response to me is that uh, if we hold and, and adopt your analysis, that does not mean that uh, on a future date, this court is foreclosed from saying that a contract does not require pro rata. That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. We're being very nerdy here. We want you to read the language of the contract. We want you to take, and Your Honor, I want you to look at the other insurance clause, and that's where you get horizontal exhaustion if we're in an all-sum state. I want you to look at non-cum and continuing well, unless coverage. Unless other insurance only applies, as argued, to the same policy. Let me address that, Your Honor, because that is referred to in Con Ed. Con Ed says, well, other insurance, that applies to two concurrent policies in the same period. But why did Con Ed say that? Because it was assuming pro rata. Counselor, if you're in an all-sums regime, then the fiction of — I'm sorry, Your Honor, but — No, I'm just sorry. You're, you're light. I was just going to say your, your time is almost up, and I would like you to, if you can, respond to your adversary's claim that for 20-plus years, uh, the excess insurers essentially uh, interpreted this contract as an all-sums contract and paid uh, claims on it that way. So, Your Honor, may I respond to the question even though the red yes, light please. is on? So, Your Honor, uh, that is not true. The, their claim is that there's extrinsic evidence that Liberty, the underlying insurer, assumed all sums, but it's — Liberty's course of conduct cannot bind us, the excess insurers. The excess insurers never agreed to all sums. We have consistently argued in this case for pro rata. In answer to Your Honor into any inconsistency in position, first I'd respectfully suggest that waivers shouldn't matter here. We're on a certified question, a pure question of law. Well, you can see why it asks, though. Yes, Your Honor, and I say that we're and, — and one more point, Your Honor, is that the earlier arguments were prior to Olin III. I'd highly commend to the Court, if nothing else, the decision in Olin III, which harmonizes pro rata with both non-cumulation and continuing coverage. And, Your Honor, I'd commend — if I could just finish one more sentence, Your Honor. The Olin amicus brief, the insured party in this case, is with the excess insurers here. Viking and Warren's counterpart in Olin filed an amicus brief on our side saying pro rata is good for the insured. Everything can be harmonized. If you read Olin three in that brief, we respectfully suggest that you'll agree with us. Pro rata is the allocation <laughs> method. And horizontal, you shouldn't reach if you go with pro rata. But if you go with all sums, find horizontal based on the other insurance clauses. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Cohen? Thank you, Your Honors. I'd like to start with Judge Fahey. Your time? Um, I'm sorry? Four minutes, Your Honor. Four? Yes, please. I'd like to start, Your Honor, with your question, um, which whether any court in the country, including a New York court, has ever adopted their new methodology, which simultaneously combines the non-cumulation provision with a pro rata allocation. No court in the country has ever done that. No New York court, no court outside the country. 
all courts have either adopted an all sums or a pro rata allocation, and there's a split of authority. In Con Edison, in the absence of a non-cumulation clause, the court found a pro rata allocation. Other courts have gone the other way. But when the non-cumulation provision is inserted into the policy, every state court, including four state supreme courts, have held that the non-cumulation provision is inconsistent with a pro rata allocation. This may be an unfair question, but do you have an explanation for why Olin is arguing the other side of this? Your Honor, it is somewhat suspicious. Um, I have my theories. It's about money. Um, but um, at the end of the day, uh, that's, that's my, my, my theory. But the point is, when you insert the non-cumulation clause into the contract, every state court has said that that turns it into an all-sums allocation. Their expert took that position below, and to Your Honor's point, they took that position below. They told the trial court, you cannot apply the non-cumulation provision in a pro rata allocation, because once you prorate, you don't have multiple policies responding to the same injury, so you don't trigger the non-cumulation provision. Let's take their example, and I'll do it very quickly. You've got a $10 million claim, right? And you've got 10 years. I'm sorry, it, there, it was a $5 million claim, right? Right. Okay. That was the cap. A $5 million a cap million and a $10 yeah. million. You're right, Your Honor. You're right, right. Yeah. So the way it would work with pro rata is you'd get a million in each year, and you'd get full coverage. In an all sums allocation, assuming that you have the $400 million in excess, the policyholder gets to pick one year and just go up vertically. What they are suggesting with this double credit, you only get five of the $10 million. And by the way, the primary carrier pays the five million and the policyholder can never get to the excess carriers. And in fact, the last five years where it's undisputably the policy has been triggered because there's injury during the policy period, they don't pay anything. No court has ever done that, Your Honor. And the reason that they are suggesting this new methodology now is because what happened below is they said to the trial court, just ignore the non-cumulation provisions and just prorate. And what Chancellor Strine found is, under the principles in Con Edison, you can't do that. You have to harmonize and give meaning to both the non-cumulation provision and during the policy period. The one injury, one occurrence? What about her first point? Your Honor, it, it, it doesn't, the one injury, one occurrence, the hypothetical that was given to them where they said you cannot apply the non-cumulation, the pro rata allocation, it was only one claim. In fact, their own hypothetical in the briefs to the court it was one claim, one occurrence. This whole issue of multiple occurrences, that's a red herring. The fact of the matter is, when you have one claim or multiple claims, it's the same. The way they've interpreted it is they get double credit that no court has ever done. The way we've done it is you harmonize the provisions. And we do it in a way that every Supreme Court has done it, and no New York court has done what they say should be done. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Mr. Frattis. Thank you, Your Honor. My one minute, I just have uh, two quick points to make with respect to the other insurance provision and the question of vertical versus horizontal exhaustion. First, I'd, I'd like to observe that if the insurance companies wanted to make that provision apply in the successive policy situation, uh, which they are urging here, they know how to do that. The non cum provision is a perfect example of it. Uh, the non cum provision expressly sweeps in other insurance uh, in its in its operation. Here, they don't didn't do that in the other insurance context. Uh, and secondly, reading the other insurance provision as counsel suggests in this case would read out the underlying insurance provisions of these policies, because the underlying insurance provisions they agree expressly refer to only the specific year's underlying insurance that must be exhausted before their policies attach. And to now say, we also have to exhaust all the other insurance in other years, reads that provision out of the policies. Thank you very much.